Dr. Zarr, I, I'd like to throw the first question at you. Uh, I, I just found this fascinating uh, when I read your bio that in your medical practice, you prescribe nature to your patients. Uh, what are some of the health benefits of, of being in nature? Well, that's a, a great question to start off with, I think. Um, so, you know, as was mentioned sort of in that, you know, early part of our program, how uh, Olmsted really thought of parks as sort of the lungs of a city, and I would extend that to be the lungs of the planet. Um, and really there for us to, I think, remind us more than anything that, you know, even though today we spend, you know, 90% of our time indoors, that we evolved for millions of years outdoors. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it, it's really the most natural thing for us to be outside. We are in fact, part of nature ourselves. Um, and we're mammals, if anybody's forgotten that. And we have more in common with the outside world, far more than we do with the inside world. And this is a, a rather circuitous way for me to get to answering your question, which is that when you think about the health benefits, I think that the easiest way to explain that is because it's so natural for us to be outdoors that we almost immediately for most people will have sort of a feeling of returning home and, and you know, of calmness. Um, you know, obviously there's a huge spectrum in terms of where you are outdoors and that experience. And for some people, obviously it might actually, you know, produce some anxiety depending on, on your context and situation. But the mental health and the physical health uh, benefits are quite um, uh, uh, pronounced in, in many people. And there are many studies that have looked at, um, you know, reduction in blood pressure, in um, uh, improvements, certainly in physical activity, which is an independent risk factor for developing chronic disease. Um, on the mental health side of things, you know, we know that um, there's an improvement in depressed mood or depression, anxiety, even some studies that have looked at schizophrenia. Um, and we know that there is also for many people uh, in some of the studies as well, um, it's an improvement in our, our sort of our social well-being. So a lot of people spend time outside with other humans. Um, it's not all of us, but uh, it's a very common thing that we do. So it's an opportunity for us um, to develop relationship and bonds with other humans. And I think that's particularly important during the last couple of years during the pandemic where uh, we quickly learned after a few months of the pandemic that uh, this um, virus was absolutely aerosolized and our, our risks of getting it were much, much lower being outside. Um, you know, we also know from a, a number of other studies that uh, there is a, a reduction in your risk of developing diabetes, of being overweight, of being obese. Uh, we know from a group of studies that were initially done um, in Japan and have now uh, been replicated in other parts of the world, including Korea and the United States and Europe and probably parts of Canada now, um, where we see a, a reduction in our um, stress hormone cortisol um, by spending time in these natural settings, particularly in forests. Um, the first initial studies I think were done in the forests in Japan, which I had the great privilege of visiting in 2019 and 2020. Um, and there was actually a study that, that looked at a, uh, a, an increase in the natural killer cells, uh, mm. which is a, you know, a, a, an ancient part of our immune system that's still around and uh, is thought to uh, reduce our risk of developing cancer. Um, so it's a, a, a long way of saying there are a lot of documented health benefits um, to being outdoors. Dr. Jennings, uh... How long has um, how long has the medical research, uh, you know, shown these benefits? Where, where I guess you know, in Olmsted's days, you know, nineteenth century, it was maybe he had clinical evidence, but it was probably more anecdotal evidence. But you know, how uh, how recent is this uh, acknowledgement of the benefits of being in nature? Uh, you know, backed up by clinical medical, medical evidence? 
That's a good question. I would um, say more so from the standpoint of public health, the clues have been there for quite some time. For example, even that classic definition from the World Health Organization about what health is. It's the complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not just the absence of disease or infirmity. So we've known for quite some time that there are different dimensions of health. I think through the years we've been putting different parts of this puzzle together. Uh, one of the studies that's often noted I believe it was published in the 80s from Roger Ulrich in terms of people being able to recover, um, uh, patients in hospitals were able to recover uh, quicker because they had a view of a green space and how that may have been another avenue for um, healing and reducing stress. But similar to what Dr. Zar mentioned before, even from a, a theoretical perspective, there's been the stress uh, reduction uh, aspect of this relationship. There's been the attention um, recovery and engagement. Uh, so there are different dimensions of in terms of really tapping into what we, you know, coin, have coined the biophilia, this innate need that we have and and we've seen that this can be beneficial from a number of standpoints when it comes to public health as well as wellness overall. Stephen, you are the, uh, the boots on the ground, so to speak. You're at the other, uh, other side of, of, of the issue, you know, working for KC Parks. How does, uh, how do you prioritize, or you know, how does KC Parks prioritize uh, the benefits of health with, the urban green spaces uh, compared to other priorities that you may have. Well, uh, at, at this point, I, if you if you look back at the at our more recent history in the parks department, that um, a lot of our ties to health come through our community centers. With um, there's health and wellness programs there, it's about you know physical activity through um, more you know structured play or. Uh, gyms and whatnot, not so much as it has been as strong a connection to the idea of just taking a walk in, in, in nature hasn't been as, as strong a focus. And, we, and we're actually really good and have a strong connection to our, our health community through those avenues. Um, but I, I do feel like it's, it's a, it's a, I was recently hired uh, just at the beginning of COVID. I came on and a month later we all went home. And, uh, but I was hired as the sustainability, as to, to manage our sustainability plan as the environmental manager here. And, and part of that is going to be looking for ways to connect uh, our, uh, people to our green spaces as that kind of get out in, into nature and get those benefits from just being out there passively walking through our either some of our forested trails we have um, we have some other uh, green spaces but so yeah i think it's something we need to build on here at casey parks get more explicit about that connection we also have the um, uh, lakeside nature center which does do a lot of programming associated with conservation and, and nature but we need to have more explicit connection there. Maybe I should have asked this at the beginning too, but um, you know, how, how do you uh, make it, I could throw this out in general, you know, how do we define green spaces? You know, uh, a wooded area is obvious, a park is, but does walking down a, a tree-lined street, does that count as, uh, being out in nature? If anybody well, I, wants, Dr. Zarr, would you? I, um, I'm, I'm over the forestry department here too, and I've a, a, I, so speaking for the trees. Um, yeah, there, I mean, I, I, there's also a lot of just strong evidence of health benefits of having a heavily treed streets and, and treed neighborhoods where you see more, more trees. So um, yeah, I, I do believe there's a gradient between a sidewalk with trees versus a sidewalk without. Um, and how much green space is there you know, versus some areas that have, if you look at downtown or the West Bottoms here in Kansas City, those of you uh, would know, there's far fewer trees and walking there at far through the green, green period plants um, might have less benefits than walking on a trailing street. All the way out to some of our very high quality natural areas, which are, are different from that. Yeah. Dr. Zar, can you talk about an example of when you would prescribe nature to someone and, and and, and what are some examples of uh, prescriptions? Uh, you know, is it a certain activity or a certain time in nature? Uh, what would a prescription look like? Sure, that's a great question. And and uh, before I dive in, you know, I I heard you call out my name about you know what exactly how I would define nature. So yeah. let me just kind of jump in a little bit there. Um, oh sure, yeah. <laughs> so you know, from from my perspective, and and I and I. 
I'm guessing it's probably a little bit different um, than the fellow pa panelists in that, you know, in, in, my, in my life of practicing, you know, these 20, 15, 20, or maybe if I'm lucky some days, 30 minute intervals, um, there's a lot to try to get done with, you know, to listen and document and there's a lot of things you're trying to do in that visit. And um, one of the things that I have learned uh, in, in these park or nature prescriptions, as I call them now, is that probably the best way for um, us to define what nature is, is really through the eyes of the person, uh, you know, we're talking to and the perspective of that person. Um, and, um, you know, I think just as, as Stephen pointed out, um, you know, very much so that it really depends on, you know, you know, where one lives, right? So you may only have a few trees. Um, you may have indoor plants for some people who live in crowded housing. Um, so it, it really is interesting when, when you ask, and this takes me to, to, to try to answer your question. When, 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 when we talk about a, a nature prescription, um, the way that I define it and, and that one will see if they come to my website and nature prescribing platform um, is that really it's about asking the right questions. And so when, when I train other physicians to prescribe, um, it's about asking the questions to your patient, to your client. The first one is, where do you feel safe and comfortable outside? And if outside didn't work during the pandemic, because it didn't for a lot of my patients, you might, you might have to rephrase that just a little bit um, and, and think about sunshine and wind and maybe a window. Um, so we really had to struggle uh, with how to sort of rephrase that question. But in general, it's where do you feel safe and comfortable outside, uh, you know, with some natural element and, and, and really listen to what the answer might be. The second question is about activity. You know, what do you intend to do outside? What do you like to do outside? What, 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 what's fun, you know, if, depending on the age and the cognitive and the developmental stage of the person in front of you, right? So they all answer it differently. The little kids like to use the word play a lot um, and the older kids, not so much so. The third question is really about frequency. So, you know, how often do you imagine yourself doing this or can you do it? Think about schedules, think about routines. So that's things that they do naturally when you ask a question in that way. And then the last is really how long can you imagine doing this for? Half an hour, 40 minutes, two hours. And once again, you know, that developmental stage and age <laughs> of the person in front of you might be, I want to be out, I want to play in a park five hours a day, mommy, you know, um, versus an adolescent might say, mm, how about 20 minutes a week? <laughs> so, you know, so that's basically what we do, how I train others to do this um, and how I've done it as well is just by asking those kinds of questions and turning those answers very quickly in a matter of a, just a really couple of minutes is really all you have into a formal prescription that is then documented inside of the patient's chart, usually electronic these days, printed for them. And then the second half of it becomes may I send you a reminder, an automated reminder to fill that prescription. So it's a contract of sorts between the doctor and the patient. It could be any healthcare professional, doesn't have to be a doctor. And it's what's supposed to happen, driven by the patient, right? This whole prescription is really driven by them, not by the doctor, um, in that space of time between one visit and the next. So it's that interval of time. And then this happens again and again and again. So we're talking about a form of treatment, not unlike medication or not unlike a referral or other diagnostic procedures that has to be considered at all these different intervals of time. So the kind of patient, it could be somebody obese, it could be somebody with diabetes or prediabetes, hypertension, hypertriglyceridemia, depression, anxiety, a variety of things or all of them at once even. It could be as simple as just chronic stress and fatigue. Um, so there are many, many situations, clinical situations that would warrant this. Um, chronic disease and risk factors for chronic disease makes up most of what doctors do, especially in the outpatient setting. So it's a very, very common thing that we could do every, every, at every visit, nearly at every, at every visit. Professor Jennings, I'll, I'll give you a chance. How, how would you define nature? Ooh, that's, that's a large one. <laughs> <And I'm, laughs> 
<laughs> well, I'm laughing because we, uh, you know, to Dr. Zar's point, there's there's the perception of it, and then there's the the academic discourse <laughs> of what nature can be and how that's categorized. And to your earlier question, even when it comes to uh, to green spaces, it's been defined in different ways. But I would say one of the centering areas is often around some type of vegetative space. It could be a park, it could be a garden, uh, green roofs. There are many dimensions of it. So while you know, similar to ourselves, we have different layers and and um, dimensions to us so does the natural environment so that's kind of why it's hard to put it in a box so to oh, speak sure. yeah. <laughs> but there are different aspects of it that a number of scholars are continuing to investigate as we think about um to dr zar's point the way that we interact what that looks like in different settings as well as how that can be characterized by different groups of people and what that space means to them all right, and just as a reminder uh, for our attendees, if you have a question for our panelists, type them in the Q&A chat box that you see at the bottom of your screen. You can also put it in the chat, regular chat box. If you're watching on Facebook, type your questions in the comments section there and we'll get to as many as we can during this program. Uh, Dr. Jennings, I wanna, I wanna stay with you for a moment. When we talk about the benefits of being in nature, access to these green spaces is the other side of the coin and we touched on this a little bit um, earlier but what are some of your concerns uh, what are some of the problems or concerns that you have uncovered in your research about equitable access to green infrastructure Good question. Good question. Well, there, there are different dimensions when we think about what accessibility is, how it's defined and characterized. For example, the, uh, the CDC's uh, environmental or public health tracking program looks at it more so in the sense of a half of a mile, you know, from someone. Uh, there also have been the 10 minute walk and there have just been different ways that that's characterized. So when we think about the landscape and how people are configured, not only in cities, but so many different places, we, we think about it from the standpoint of how that appears um, to where they live, but also how that's configured. If, if a location is technically, um, let's say a half a mile away, can, is there a trail or something where it can be walkable to get there? Is there adequate parking once there, there is access is that particular uh, respect? But some things that I've come across uh, continue to in my work is um, some of those other undergirding issues in this social environment, whether it's the quality of, a, of the park. So you can have access to a park, but it is, is it one that is well maintained, has uh, the amenities that are aligned with your interest, right? But there's also that standpoint of even thinking about it from the standpoint of not only access to proximity, but also the environment in the sense of it being safe and one that people feel like they can really um, actually appreciate, but also belong as well. So access has different dimensions to it, but when we think about it from the standpoint of um, some of my area of work, it's not only the, the configuration, the meaning, but also what that looks like in different dimensions of access. And uh, some of my more recent work, even talking about that in the sense of even gentrification, that's not my uh, wheelhouse of, you know, particular expertise, but we look at access for how long, <laughs> you know, if it's from the standpoint of, of different aspects of development, who has access to it, and for what period of time when it comes to changes in the landscape, the changes in property values, and all that goes into that. That's a segue into our next poll question. If my, if Christina, if you want to put the second poll question up. How far do you live from a park? Uh, a park being defined um, kind of however you want to define it, uh, you know, an urban or a rural green space, uh, half a mile or less, a half to one mile or more than one mile. We'll give you a moment to, to fill those up, to complete that question. And I think uh, just based on the tally so far, it correlates with the first question, uh, asking about how much time you spend in nature. And most of our attendees spend, uh, you know, two to five hours in nature per week. And I think maybe part of that is because most people live a half mile or less. You can, you can end the poll now, Christina. 
Uh, Stephen, I want to ask you about uh, a couple of things that Professor Jennings talked about. Uh, you know, she mentioned parks being within a half mile or a, a 10 minute walk from from a residence. Um, does KC Parks uh, take that in, into consideration when planning parks and green spaces? Most definitely. Uh, and, uh, you know, some of our newer parks and where we're still expanding is, is, is north of the river. We, we definitely have less growth uh, to the south and, and, and east. Um, and then we have our state line. But uh, so as we it, as we are growing in the Northland, there's definitely consideration of de new dedicated sparks, park space and, and those things. We uh, were pretty uh, lucky for historically, we had a lot of parks that were developed. Um, we scored fairly high on um, the uh, the Trust for Public Lands um, evaluation of, of parks and access to um, parks um, from the, from a uh, equity standpoint. Um, because we have a lot of a lot of historical parks in, in the main part of Kansas City south of the river down there, I should say main part, but the part of Kansas City south of the river. Uh, I do think there's still a lot of questions about the, the quality of those parks and I, I, I think maybe later I can speak to some of the efforts we've made on looking at um, access and looking at equity in terms of the way our parks uh, are developed and, and maintained. Um, we've done some recent work on that. Uh, but it's definitely part of what we think about when we're looking at where our parks are. Oh, if you want to, yeah, you can talk about that now if you want to okay. touch on well, some of that work. There's a, there was a study done in Kansas City. We had a, a set of uh, zip codes that had lower life expectancies in them. Um, we uh, developed a brand new parks district called the CULID district. It stands for Quality Life uh, uh, Investment District. Um, there were uh, 38 parks in that, uh, in the lowest life expectancy zip codes that we have. And, and we, the point of creating a new district was that we were going to have um, more resources applied to those, those areas to improve the, the parks we have there for either uh, improved you know, um, uh, playgrounds or more trees, um, improved uh, sidewalks, whatever it happens to be that we would be able to uh, look at having a higher investment in those parks, uh, increasing access to looking at um, working with other parts of the city to look at um, creating a bike routes to those parks, other walking routes, so that we can do that. And it's it's uh, it's still brand new. It's only about it, we just started it up during COVID, so um, but, you know it's it hasn't been out very long. But that we have it definitely. So we have this now new entire district to try to address some of those um, some historical um, issues we had with. The quality and investment we had in, in those park systems over in that area of town. And I read recently, uh, you know, within the past couple of days, there are plans for a uh, park it, right in downtown Kansas City, right? The the six seventy corridor is that? I, I've heard I've heard that that is <laughs> I've heard that they're thinking about that. There's uh, I, I think there might be some some uh, federal dollars coming out of, of the infrastructure plan that to uh, cap. Our, uh, the 670 loop um, for the, uh, to other speakers, we have a, a loop around our downtown and, and the 670 part is very much deeply set, you know, basically a, 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 a car canyon. And uh, if we could cap that off, we can put park in above that. It would, it would greatly increase the amount of green space downtown by being able to do that. Um, yeah, but I, yeah. I don't know where we are with that at this point. I think that's still- I, Yeah, I saw something on the news phase. about it, so. Uh, <laughs> Didn't mean to surprise you with that uh, during the program. Uh, you mentioned COVID, and uh, Dr. Zar, have you have you seen uh, an increase in people's willingness to be in nature uh, since COVID hit? You know, March 2020 or so. And um, have have you seen? You know, despite the negative health impacts of COVID, have you seen in in a maybe you know weird way, positive impacts because people are in nature more, if yeah, that I, makes sense. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, you know, I've seen, I've seen sort of two extremes. Um, and, you know, you asked earlier about equity. Um, and I, you know, every doctor practices in a different, you know, a unique setting. Um, I have practiced, you know, 20 plus years. Um, in a community health center. So, um, you know, my patients have taught me a lot. Um, they're very intelligent 
people who um, may not uh, more times than, than, than not, you know, don't have the access to the kinds of things that they need on the social determinants of health. So, um, you know, they don't have the opportunities um, that their peers would um, in terms of education and food and transportation and finance and certainly access to green space. So I think that, you know, from, from my perspective, like what I saw um, was that um, those differences between, between people who um, had access and had good routines um, fared quite well um, during the pandemic. They had a place to walk. They had places they felt safe and comfortable. They had places they could actually walk to um, and, and did that and could maintain their physical and mental health. Um, on the other extreme, a lot of my patients uh, and their families, um, many of them, you know, they live in overcrowded, substandard housing. Um, and even though um, they depended normally on public space um, with natural elements, we like to call parks, uh, many of them were very fearful of going outdoors. Um, so what we were seeing and continue to see are huge exacerbations in mental health. Um, so lots of depression, um, lots of mental health burden in, in that population, um, as well as, you know, rising rates of obesity and overweight. And with that, the physical inactivity and with that, an increase in um, prediabetes. So we've seen um, in, in that population a lot of worsening. Um, it's been a while since the beginning. So we're now, you know, uh, actually in, into year three of the pandemic. And um, some are actually calling it endemic now. Uh, but we're still seeing somewhere between 300 and 600 deaths a day uh, in the United States. And uh, if you do the math there, it's somewhere around 100,000. Um, a year if this keeps up. So it's, it's still a lot of loss. And, you know, to add to that, uh, a lot of my patients and their families um, are and were and are continue to be um, essential workers. So a lot, a lot of risk involved. And, you know, the way I would sort of try to finish off my, my, my comment, my response to this is that um, ever so more important <laughs> for, for people um, I've been serving for 20 years to have a safe and comfortable place to be in a nature rich environment, um, ever more so than that, like more so than ever, because this, this, this COVID has given us um, a lens to exacerbate you know, those kinds of differences that we see between those who do have access and those who don't to these natural spaces. Professor Jennings, have you have you seen similar things where COVID has uh, magnified maybe some of these inequalities with access to green spaces? Right, right. Well, I think um, particularly in my work where we looked at access to green spaces and how that overlaps health disparities, making those major gaps in health by different uh, variables. When we looked at the literature, there were some reoccurring themes. For example, uh, obesity, heat-related illness, psychological well-being, as well as cardiovascular outcomes. So to Dr. Zar's uh, previous point, you know, the differences in access to these resources mean differences that we've also seen overlap. Um, the health sphere in many cases. That may not always be the case, but when we think about the larger scope of the factors that impact health, such as the, the social determinants of health, uh, those differences matter. And when we are in this type of just prism of, of challenges um, through this pandemic and before it, quite honestly, these are things that are gonna continue to worsen, but this is where we have an opportunity to really step up and do something different. All right, we have a question from Stephen. Thank you, Stephen, for tuning in tonight. Uh, Stephen asks, as parks are being established or refurbished, are there considerations about foregoing resource-intensive lawns in favor of natural vegetation for zones that aren't subject to foot, foot traffic play? Uh, I mean, Stephen, maybe that's uh, in your wheelhouse. Oh, uh, it definitely is. <laughs> um, Great, I'm glad someone asked something about that. Uh, it's definitely well, one of the reasons why I was hired here. Uh, we are looking at not just uh, reducing the amount of turf grass for um, 
in all the environmental reasons for that, but also because it is expensive to, to mow things. Um, so we're basically undertaking uh, a, 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 an assessment of the parks, looking for spaces that have um, the slopes, they're difficult to mow for some reason already, they require more resource input as the first places we would look to convert from turf grass to uh, native grasses and wildflowers. Um, we are on the edge of the tall grass prairie here we, we, uh, in Kansas City. Uh, we historically had a, quite a few of our, our landscapes were either a savanna or, or prairie. So we're looking at uh, areas we can convert to native landscapes that way. Um, we'll, we'd, we'd manage, if possible, by um, prescribed burning, if not, a, the occasional once a year mow uh, or some other methods to try to, to keep them that way. But it would be a lot more resource intensive um, once established and also provide um, great stormwater management, um, uh, uh, habitat for important in insects and in birds. Um, we're currently experiencing our sixth, uh, great, the sixth great extinction. Um, a lot of uh, native, important native uh, uh, insects are on decline, so we need more uh, habitat for them. So there's a great deal of benefits for it. Um, aesthetically, it is, is, is different from what the City Beautiful movement was back in a lot of parks expected. Um, it is is um, it's a prairie, and uh, it's it's I I find it to be the most beautiful thing out there, um, and but not everybody is readily acceptable. That there have been some phenomenological studies that have been done with people and their access to uh, prairie planting, and uh, at first they kind of look at it and think it's a little bit unkempt, but after they they live with it for a few years, um, people tend to gravitate toward it and think it, 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 and learn to see the dynamicism of it. That how dynamic and change, ever changing it is. Uh, and I think there's a, a whole level of, of other programming we could do on interacting with uh, the plants, looking at getting excited when we see a plant that's being, um, uh, has uh, herbivory on it, looking that's been eaten, because most likely what that is, is it's, it's, there's a caterpillar that's gonna turn into a butterfly that's eating that plant. So we're not just growing plants, we're growing butterflies, we're growing birds. Um, uh, there's some great literature out there from uh, Dr. Uh, Tallamy on, on bringing nature home in one of his books that shows uh, how important it is to do this. So I'm, I'm working very hard uh, with parks to try to look for more of those areas we can convert over time. Uh, and and in, in that, even some of our small landscapes that we were putting in uh, ornamental uh, uh, annual plants and buying them every year, we are replacing those with perennial native plants and reducing our costs over time and creating more um, environmentally friendly uh, spaces. And those butterflies will pollinate plants and crops and help our food supply. It's all big one cycle. Right? Yeah, it, it is. A lot of people understand there's a lot of things we eat that, that are only pollinated by um, uh, uh, bumblebees because bumblebees can sonicate. And so there's things like tomatoes and blueberries and whatnot that we need bumblebees for in their native uh, um, species of, uh, of bee that, that needs uh, native landscapes in order to, to thrive. Yeah. Right, as a reminder, if you have a question for our panelists, type them in the Q&A chat box that you see at the bottom of your screen. If you're on Facebook, type them in comments and we'll get to as many as we can during the remaining minutes uh, of the program. Dr. Zar, you're a, you're a pediatrician, so you know, I assume most of your patients and most of your nature prescriptions are for children, correct? Yes, I mean, I, I see from just, you know, a few days of life um, to, you know, uh, young adults. Um, so it's, a, it's a, for me, a pretty wide spectrum, but I guess for my family medicine colleagues, um, you know, they, they really do from, they do all ages. So but that's generally my population that I see. Do you, uh, you know, do you see a difference in, in, in a willingness to be out in nature among different age groups within that population? And, and maybe even compared to adults? Yeah, I mean, I, I, there are absolutely huge differences uh, in, in conversation um, and then in prescriptions that, that, you know, happen during a visit. Um, you know, I, I really encourage, um, you know, a conversation, you know, by asking those questions that I kind of went through earlier. Um, and I can alluded to that also in terms of, you know, the, the really young ones, um, even when we're talking just a few, you know, days of life, there isn't a whole lot of conversation that I have with them where I get answers back from them. But, you know, I am, I'm 
I'm, you know, speaking to the parents and, and there's a lot of benefits, not just for the kid, obviously, but for um, their entire family. Uh, so when you think about, um, you know, a woman who's just given birth, um, there's a lot of stress <laughs> involved in that uh, perinatal period. Um, and um, a lot of need uh, for care for the mother uh, in particular. So, you know, it really, even at that very, very young age for the baby, you know, I, I do ask some questions about um, exposure to sunlight and fresh air, um, not just for the baby, but for the mother. And as the child develops, um, you know, I'm very curious to know, uh, you know, how and where they spend their time. Um, so going back to the social determinants of health and, you know, access to, um, you know, safe uh, green space or nature rich areas, um, kids, especially at a young age, we're talking from zero to three and, and uh, even through five and six years old, you know, there's unstructured play is a very, very important part of their development, um, their creativity. So it's not, it's, it, they're, they're slightly harder to define perhaps than like blood pressure and the things I mentioned earlier, but um, very, very important for them. And I would say that, you know, as children get older, um, you know, they get more involved and more expected to do, um, you know, organized sports and organized activities. Um, but I still think it's so important to ask these questions of even the you know, the, the adolescents and young adults in terms of, you know, where, where do they spend, you know, we do, you know, how do they spend their time outdoors? What do they do? Um, and uh, I was just thinking about a, a patient of mine, I was asking, if, you know, where he felt safe and comfortable. Um, and this is an adolescent I'm thinking of. And um, he went so far, and this is completely unprompted, he told me that there was a specific rock that he likes to lie on in Rock Creek Park, which happens to be his, you know, his accessible park to him. Um, and it, it floored me, right? I mean, I, these are the kinds of responses I get from pe people, regular people, <laughs> you know, when you ask him these kinds of questions. And, you know, I asked him his reasons why, and, and he said, you know, he happens to live in a large family and crowded housing and sometimes, you know, for someone like that, the only opportunity they have to, to be alone and uh, is to be somewhere out in nature. So for him, it was a particular, a literally a particular rock to lie on. So um, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's a, these are relevant questions um, for almost any age, but I think you have to be aware of, of uh, the kinds of responses you might get back and, and um, you know, we, as a healthcare professional, to sort of wear that that hat um, slightly differently um, because I mentioned, you know, the, the the similarities in some ways between the medication prescription and a nature prescription. But a nature prescription really turns things kind of on its head in a way because normally with a medication prescription, we might ask a few questions to figure out about allergies and um, sometimes uh, the effects of taking other medications with the one you're thinking about prescribing, et cetera. But oftentimes it's very doctor centered. Um, and with the nature prescription, really it's about um, asking the right questions and then being on the, on the sidelines a bit more and you know, wearing that hat of yours as a professional um, to see where tweaks can be suggested to sort of get as much therapeutic out of that prescription as possible, therapeutic, you know, maximum out of it, while, while keeping it still very much drafted by, created and drafted and manipulated by the patient and the family. All right, we have a question from Carrie uh, who writes, she has a mother with COPD with limited mobility um, and several others are in similar conditions with limited access to green spaces. Uh, Dr. Jennings, I, I could throw this at you. How would you recommend encouraging a change in behavior to increase time spent outside? Well, one, it's, what if, you rephrase the last part of the question with change in behavior with what now? With, um, oh, asked by, Christina, can you put that question back up? Um, how would you recommend encouraging a change in behavior to increase time spent outside? In right. Nature? Well, that's a good question. I think from, from what you read, you know, one of the inherent challenges is not having access to nature and, you know, being able to reframe that in terms of what that means and what 
a person has access to is the beginning. So the change in behavior, I would say, is more so in terms of really changing the narrative or really changing the environment so that people do have access to those spaces. Because it's, it's challenging to for doctors, are to, like as he mentioned before, to write a prescription to go to a place if that place is not available. Um, so I think really getting to that inequality and improving it would be the would be the first step when it comes to having that opportunity. You know, and, and safety has uh, you know the word safety has been mentioned a few times. I think all three of you have used that words. Uh, Professor Jennings, I'll, I'll, I'll stay with you. Uh, I guess, what is the importance of, you know, of, of safety? It, it seems to be a very important aspect of uh, not only having access to green space, but feeling safe in that environment. Absolutely, absolutely. When we think of, you know, different hierarchies of needs, if you will, we go back <laughs> um, to that literature, just having a place that you feel safe to recreate is not something everyone has access to. So the prescription or the idea of going to that park um, isn't gonna be a benefit that a person can have if they don't feel safe there, whether that's physically, if they concern that there could be violence or something else um, that would be a deterrent from them uh, actually taking part in that activity. So the safety piece is a big part of the social environment that would encourage people to go to these places. And Stephen, I'm sure uh, you at Casey Parks think about safety uh, quite a bit. I'm, I'm sure, correct? Oh, you're you're muted. Thank you. Yeah, uh, we do. Um, we have a park ranger program that's kind of in its infancy. Um, we think about lighting. There's uh, um, and other aspects for safety. We. I think there's a lot of work to be done, and also it's it's a conversation with other parts of the city uh, in terms of safety. Uh, it's it's a, certainly not a, a, a responsibility that parks can take on completely um, with what how that happens. Um, it's one of our thoughts with QLID, uh, um, looking at that. There are um, standards that I'm less familiar with that um, look at um, you know how to develop spaces to, cre to create the more safety in spaces. So you know lines of sight. Um, uh, one of the things we were looking at trying to do in a lot of our parks is to remove, we have an invasive species called shrub honeysuckle that creates a lot of um, blind spots. It takes over our wooded areas and, and, and we're trying to remove that to create more uh, open views and, and people will feel safer as they as we get rid of that. It's a very difficult process though. So. All right, we have a, another question uh someone someone asked about the effects of seasons uh are there differences between people who live their entire lives in uh, say southern florida where I, I assume what they mean you know the, the weather's warm and nice year round uh compared to people who live their entire lives uh, uh, say in wisconsin where you know they may not be uh maybe not be able to get outdoors a lot or maybe willing to get outdoors because it's so cold. I, I know, Dr. Zarr, you wanna um, take yeah, that? Or are, are, are there a lot of healthy people in Florida or, <laughs> well, or it know, really doesn't matter where you I, live? I, I am chuckling a bit because you know I, I spent many years growing up and, and going to school in Texas. And then I moved mm -hmm. to Washington DC where I thought it was freezing in the winter and actually have four seasons. And then now I'm currently living in Canada. They call the, you know, the, uh, the great white North. Um, so <laughs> I've seen quite a bit of fluctuation in my own life in terms of weather patterns. Um, I, I once, you know, went for a, a walk meeting um, uh, with um, a gentleman who uh, it was, it was going to, you know, look like the forecast was rain. And I think I had suggested if he wanted to meet indoors, we could and, and he very quickly retorted, you know, there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad gear. Um, <laughs> and it's always stuck in my head um, a little bit. But, you know, absolutely, seasons do make a difference. Um, and there are risks to um, being outdoors, just as there are risks to being indoors. <laughs> so I just always like to kind of, you know, you got to be able to weigh, you know, the, uh, the pros and cons of each. We know very well what the risks of being indoors are, right? It means a risk of inactivity, of more likely eating, of depression. I mean, the list goes on and on. 
And we know, on the other hand, the risks of being outdoors, certainly depending on um, your questions of mobility, on your cardiovascular health, on um, other environmental factors, um, sun, uh, so you have heat exhaustion, you have dehydration, you have to worry about ticks. I mean, there's a, there are issues. There are things that we do need to educate the public about. I think park agencies are involved in that, public health agencies are involved in that, um, as well as doctors. So um, when I talk about nature prescriptions, I do also, you know, remind my colleagues to, you know, to, to remind patients um, to, to, to take water with them, you know, to protect their skin um, from, from, from uh, extreme sun, um, to think about what times of the day might be better to go out um, when we talk about schedules and routines. Um, so these things are, are actually important to talk about. Um, and depending on the age, you know, very young and, and, and uh, the elderly as well, falls um, are significant, right? So um, there's, there are things to, to, uh, to think about with seasons. Um, I just survived and enjoyed incredibly much the winter here in Ottawa. And um, never had I experienced anything like that in my life. Um, but there are things to do <laughs> outdoors in That's inclement true. weather. Um, and we need to make, we're, we're, we're one thing that humans are, they're adaptable. <laughs> so um, by wearing the proper clothing and having the proper gear, this brings up questions of equity again, because not everybody has access to the same kind of gear that we need. Um, but in a, in, a, in a world where we can sort of level that playing field a bit more, um, and, and I, you know, that's important to consideration to make when, when talking about how to deal with the seasonality. I would also add, you know, with seasons, sure. there, there are dimensions of it when we think about not only the, the opportunities for recreation at different parts of the year, but to even other threats, whether that's pollen and someone having some respiratory issues. But I also, as I was thinking about that question, uh, thinking about some research that I was involved in in Tampa, Florida, where we were looking at the coverage of tree cover and then health outcomes, such as cardiovascular and respiratory disease. So in that Tampa, Central Florida area, um, there were some inequalities, but when we did a bit more digging and really looking at some research from scholars um, who conducted research prior in that area, there was concern around storm, storm um, damage from hurricanes and the such. So some of the preferences when it even came to the types of green spaces can vary, uh, not only with geographical location, but other perceived safety concerns related to the green space. And as we can imagine, that can also impact health. So while someone may live in, let's say a Tampa or a, a a warmer location, they could be right around the corner from a park, but they may engage in sedentary behavior when they're there. They may just want to sit in a tree and read a book. <laughs> so while they have access to it, are they involved in higher levels of figure, uh, physical activity is subjective. And uh, so there's the access, but also the programming and different factors that are involved with actually getting out and getting moving. Right, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Uh, Stephen, there was a, a question for you about the Northland, and I, I, I had nothing to do with that. Uh, for to let everyone know, before we started the program, we were chatting, and I asked, I, I live up in the Northland, and I asked Stephen the, the question. Um, uh, the question is, well, you know, what, what are the park plans for that part of the city? Sure. Uh, I apologize for trying to answer that in the in the chat, and then I end up only sending it to the host and panelists. But um, yeah, no. so we we add parkland as 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 areas are developed. There's always a parkland dedication as part of, and it can be in, in lieu of in fee in lieu of, but we get more land added in the northland as it gets developed. Um, <clears throat> so the the expectation is, of course, to have a similar level similar similar level of access all across the city within you know, a, a ten minute walk of a park. Um, and so th there may be some lag between the speed of development and the development of our parks at Northland. I think in the, in the short run, you expect some of our parks in the Northland to be slightly less developed. Um, by that, I mean less um, physical structures like a, a shelter or ball fields and whatnot to have some more natural areas with trails. And then as we have more resources and parks, we'll continue to develop that. 
I would say as a very geographically large city, we are one of the, if you look at our square miles within the city of Kansas City, we are one of the very largest cities in the, in the country. By, and then, so it is difficult to maintain the 200 plus parks that we have, the 223 parks we have. And as we continue to grow, we have, we have to add more park space. So it's, um, I think there's gonna be a little bit of a lag as we continue to, to get the resources for that. All right, our last, our last few minutes. Uh, let's just go around the horn and you know, give me any final thoughts, comments, uh, advice you have for attendees. Dr. Zar, I'll, I'll start with you. Any, any final comments uh, you'd well, like to you pass know, yeah, along? I, I kind of wanted to you know, get back to that, that, that patient with, with COPD for just a moment, right. chronic disruptive sure. pulmonary disease and limited mobility and, and just dig in a little deeper because I think that could be emblematic of you that know, you may know what, you are. what a lot of people are thinking about and experiencing honestly in their lives, right? So, you know, uh, when you have lung disease, um, you often have heart disease too. Um, and with that often does um, create a limited sense of, uh, a limited mor mobility issues. Um, and this, I think, ties back a little bit to what Dr. Jennings was um, saying earlier about you know, activity and willingness and programming um, and to get people moving. I, I did want to point out though that, you know, that part of our challenge in the um, healthcare delivery system, uh, especially with these nature prescriptions, is to be really aware of, of, of that person's um, abilities. So from a sort of an asset framing perspective, right? What do they like to do? What do they want to do? What do they need? Rather than a list of problems, right? So doctors are very good at um, seeing patients as a list of problems, literally. So I'd like to sort of turn that around a little bit and speak about how nature prescriptions can be really a form of sort of asset framing. You know, when you ask those kinds of questions, you know, what is it that they can and are willing to do within the context of their lives and their environment? And, and that's not to say that changing policy isn't important. Of course it is, right? I mean, we do need to work on the, the issue of access, um, the questions of, of, uh, of equity uh, when, it, when it comes to, to green space. But we also have to think about what to do in the here and now. Like right now you have somebody with COPT, COPD and limited mobility. And it raises questions of what they can do now. It raises questions of public health in terms of, of uh, you know, primordial, primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary prevention, risk reduction. It raises issues and questions about mental health. So sometimes, you know, if you can't take somebody to nature, bring nature to them, right? Think about bringing indoor plants. Indoor plants have in, in, in a very important role in maintaining health um, for people who have limited mobility. Think about um, even photographs of nature in indoor, state, in indoor settings. Dr. Jennings referred to an article published in 1982 by, by, by Ulrich. So we, we know that, that, that if you can't get to that, ide that ideal place, um, where can we get to metaphorically and, and literally? Um, and then not to forget about those mental health benefits. So sitting under a tree um, maybe just the right thing. Um, it makes me think about a patient of mine who um, was anxious and having a lot of chronic stress. Turned out her father um, had to take a trip to Cuba and um, unfortunately um, hit a horse while driving and was badly injured and stuck in Cuba for probably weeks or months. Um, and when I asked her where that place was, she said it was a tree at the National Zoo and I asked her what she, what she was willing to do and she, she wanted to sit with her back against that tree. So I knew right away, okay, she probably has to walk there. So there is some physical activity, but she also needs that mental health recuperation. She needs that stress reduction that she's getting literally from the tree. So I just want to kind of point out that, you know, it's, it's, it's all interrelated, as you said, Eric, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's hard to pinpoint one thing, um, but just to remember that we are complicated, our lives are complicated, and to work with that chaos in the best way we can, keeping in mind we've got good, solid scientific evidence to support the actions that we're trying to take, both in the policy world and in the medical world. Professor Jennings, um, any, any final thoughts, comments, um, or what's on your research radar now? 
my research radar, uh, a number of things, continuing to dive into um, those social dimensions, social cohesion, and what that looks like uh, across different communities. Uh, early this year, I did an article or blog more so in uh, the conversation talking about the four resolutions <laughs> that we can have for the environment and how the um, how our relationship with nature was a key part of that in terms of how we reimagine the relationship, how we can continue to develop it and even um, meet people where they are. And to really ask the question so that we remember that these natural amenities as they're often framed are considered or being reminded that they are a big part of the ecological backbone of our spaces and not just the accessories that we need um, for different outcomes. But when we really bridge that gap in some innovative ways, it'll be best uh, for both uh, ourselves as well as the natural environment. Stephen, any final thoughts? Uh, you know, something you're excited about at KC Parks or, or something we all should be excited about uh, that you're working on? So, so many things, but <laughs> I'll try to limit myself. Um, I will say that uh, I'm looking forward to as we get more of the uh, uh, native landscaping in place and more of the prairies that looking at creating uh, programming around that to connect people with those those resources in, in a more full uh, in a fuller way. Yeah, um, there was at least one one bit of research out there. I'd love to see some more research on the difference between um, you know different qualities of greenery. Not to, to put too much um, emphasis on that, but. Uh, there was at least one study that suggested with greater biodiversity that some of these benefits were were even more pronounced. Um, there's very little little out there on that. There's a 2007 study by Fuller, but um, I, I be, as an ecologist and with my other overlapping priorities with uh, trying to uh, um, reduce uh, the effects of climate change and increase habitat for uh, beneficial insects and all that, I love to be able to combine these two things together as 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 uh, so I'm looking to be really get KC Parks. Uh, I'd love us to be recognized uh, as one of the uh, most um, biodiverse park systems in the country at some point. That's a, a goal for me. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a comment in the chat about Giving Grove, that's, which is a partner of ours that, that does, we have some of our parks that have orchards on them. Uh, and a, another thing I'd like to create is a uh, food forest using native plants uh, with a lot of the native plants that can that are great for producing food products we have one amazing fruit here in the Kansas City area called uh, um, uh, sorry um, the custard apples what, what name for it it was uh well, why can't I think of the actual name for this anyway it's a um, a pawpaws and they are this crazy almost tropical fruit that we have to grow here and, and some of our naturalists have them you can pick them and they I think they're a combination of uh, of uh, um, kind of pineapple and banana, and um, they're delicious, and they are ready to go in late August and September, and so um, go pick one. We have a tree here on, on the library grounds, actually, so uh, somebody can walk the arboretum and, and, and pick some uh, later this fall. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Dr. Jannings. Thank you, Dr. Zarr. It's been a great conversation. The hour has flown by. We're actually a little past the hour. So, but thank you so much for uh, taking the time to share your expertise this evening. Thanks for having us. Definitely, thank you. Most welcome, thank, thank you. And thank you everyone for attending tonight's program. For information about all of our upcoming events at the Linda Hall Library, go to lindahall.org. And when you visit our website, I hope that you also take the time to make a donation to the Linda Hall Library Foundation. All of your contributions make our programs possible and freely available. Thank you again and have a great rest of your evening.